I remember 10 years ago, I, my, my brain works like this, I remember that, that, that when we launched Labor Day roughly uh, 2012, I remember thinking in terms of like 10 years from now, and I remember thinking two, two things. Um, I, I remember thinking, I bet in 10 years I'm gonna be really tired and maybe ready to retire, and, and I also thought, in 10 years I'm gonna be super old, and here we are, uh, here we are 10 years later, and it has gone by quickly. Good morning. Welcome to River Church. 20 years ago in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, I was in my early 30s, and Lydia and I had uh, young kids, a house full of young kids. And I remember this, this, young, this other young family that lived roughly in our neighborhood at, one day asking us, because our children uh, were in the same classroom, at least one of our, chil- one of our children, one of their children, they asked us if we would watch their children, I think they already had two children, for a day or two while they went to the hospital and, 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 and the mama gave birth to, to their third child. Now, what struck me as, as weird about that was we really didn't know this family at all. Uh, I didn't even know their, their names. Uh, our children simply went to school together. And they explained to us how uh, they, although they lived in Albuquerque, uh, for a couple of years at that point, they had uh, no family in town, they had no friends. <clears throat> and so uh, we gladly did it. I guess they thought we were trustworthy or we were their only hope or whatever. They were desperate, but, but we, we took their children for a day at least while they went to, went to the hospital and they had their baby. And I thought a lot about that over the, ne- over the course of the next few weeks after that transpired. And, and, and I've actually continued to think about it over the last 20 years. I think I've even told you this story before. Because it so struck me, because it was such a, a microcosm of the culture that we live in. Uh, what I mean by that is that most people in our country, most people in the society that we function in, they live a largely friendless lifestyle. And that may be you today. You may live a largely friendless lifestyle. And what I want to compel you to believe um, is that is a spiritual matter. This is week three of our, uh, this, this fun topical uh, series that we're going through. In the summer, we take a little time and we do a topical series often in the summertime. And uh, this is week three, so if you've not been here before, it's kind of like jumping on a moving train. You probably need to hear weeks one and two. Those are online if you want to hear uh, weeks one and two of this series. But, but, but today, week three, we're talking about womanhood and the essential nature of relationships. Womanhood and the essential nature of relationships. <clears throat> Most people in our day, I think this has increased significantly over the course of my lifetime, most people in our day live a largely friendless lifestyle. And what I want to compel you to believe today is that is not how God has designed you. That is not how God has designed you to live. And therefore, if you are living a friendless existence, then you're not thriving. So today what we're talking about is, it's fun, it's God-designed, we're talking about friendship, specifically through the lens of womanhood, but obviously if you're a man and you're listening, listening in, much of this is applicable. You may need to hear this more than your wife or more than your female friend. There's a spiritual benefit, in fact, to friendship in the church. Hear me, you may not have thought about it in this light before. There's a spiritual benefit. I mean, there's a personal benefit as you're discipled by a friend, as you are sharpened in your spiritual walk. Certainly, there is that, there are those benefits. But there's another benefit that you may not have thought about before, a spiritual benefit to friendship in the church, and that is this. Friendship within the church fosters the opportunity for outsiders to belong 
before they believe. In other words, if, you, if they like you, they may come to church with you and hear the gospel, the story of Jesus, and, and, and become a follower, follower of Jesus for a lifetime simply because of the friendship that you have fostered with them. So friendship within the church actually fosters a culture of evangelism. I could point to, and I won't, but I could point to a few of you in this room today who came to River Church and you belonged before you believed as a result of some friendship that was fosters, that was fostered. God did not create human beings to be isolated persons. That is born out of secular culture. That is born out of brokenness that you can actually make it on your own. God did not design you to be isolated, but rather in making us in his image, the imago dei in you, the, the, the image of God in you, you as an image bearer, in that he made us in such a way that, that we can attain interpersonal unity of, of various sorts. Now, interpersonal unity, relationship, can, can be especially deep in, in the human family, the, the biological family, but also that deep sort of interpersonal unity can be found in the spiritual family, the body of Christ, the church. Now, this is a series on womanhood, and, and woman, I want you to hear me. You were created not to be isolated, not to be cut off. You were, you were created to be a part of perhaps a biological family, but also a friend group and the church, some combination of all of those. And, and, and in order to thrive in, in, in who you are, as an image bearer of God, you, you, you will be, you need to be in relationship. Now, I've said something about what I'm about to say again. I've said a little bit here and a little bit there. Over the last three weeks, and, and I'll say it again, the systematic mistreatment and oppression of women culturally, historically, has, has led to something for all its faults and, 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 and some, of its, some of its positives. It has led to, uh, a, in fits and starts, the, these movements that, that roughly fall under this category of, of feminism, and we're not here to, to bash or, or to uphold uh, any and all of the different tenets of that, that, that movement, if you want to call it that. But, but here's, what, here's, here's what I want to say about that. This, this, this movement, this... So, so I think of, like, my parents' generation, uh, and I think of the, the song, the original song from the 70s, I think it was from the 70s. Uh, it, was, it was sung by uh, Helen Reddy. It's I Am Woman. And in the 60s and the 70s, there was this, the birth of this... This, this movement known as feminism, and again, I'm not here to espouse or to, to uphold that movement, but, but, but there, were, there, were, there were ladies, again, from my parents' generation, in university hallways, high school lunchrooms, downtown office buildings, you know, forming this, this movement and, and singing this song, I Am Woman, and, and I picture teenage Young ladies marching down the high school hallway singing that song, I'm a woman. Now, fast forward to like my oldest daughter's 
generation, and I can hear the modern teen dancing to Katy Perry's Roar, or I can hear my younger daughter's generation dancing and singing along to another song, totally different song, also called I Am Woman by uh, Emmy, Emmy Melly. But in this, in this, this cry, this kind of a, a, re, a, a reaction to uh, brutal, brutal oppression of, of women historically, in, in, that, in, that, in that response, with this cry of, we don't need a man to be happy. Also, interestingly to me, um, comes this other cry which says, but we do need each other. We, we do need to band together as sisters. And why is that? It's, it's, it's because in, in every woman is the need for community. It's woven into the fabric of who you are. Again, it's one of the, it's one of the characteristics that makes you an image bearer of God. And you may not think of God as being in relationship with anybody, but we're going to unpack that a little bit today. So if you have no, if you have no plan to or desire to be married, that, that is potentially, if that is how God has designed you, then that is that is. That is good for you, according to the Apostle Paul and according to the teaching of Jesus. If that is you, Histori- I'm, I'm sorry, uh, um, statistically, that, that's potentially a very small part of the, the crowd that, 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 that we have here today, but, but that may be you. But if that is you, if you plan, desire um, to be single for the rest of your life. By the way, I've, I've, been, I've been asked about this next week. We're going to go hard after uh, single womanhood. That's, that's the whole sermon. I've been a little bit intimidated to preach on that, but that is what I'm preaching on next week. God's perspective, a biblical perspective on singleness, and specifically singleness as a woman. So that's, that's, that is next week. I'll, I'll, let you know, I'll, I'll commit to that for sure now. Some of you have been asking. Um, if, if, if that's you, uh, then you still need relationship. God has designed you such that you still need interdependence. That's what we're talking about today. Here's, here's the word of the Lord, Genesis 2, 18. We're going to look at a number of passages today, but here's, here's one. In, this is actually, Lotoha uh, Yot Adam Le Bado, simply, that's, that's the Hebrew, simply in its most basic translated form, it means not good for the human to be alone. Not good for the person, the human. Adam could also be translated man in the generic sense to be alone. God looked down and determined not good to be alone. It goes on poetically, you know this, uh, if you're a student of the Bible, it goes on it goes on in a very beautiful, poetic way to say, see, let, us, let us create woman. But I think there is so much more to this one simple phrase than, than just simply, a dude needs a sidekick, so let's create woman. Certainly this does mean that Adam needed Eve. Certainly it does mean that I need Lydia. Certainly it does need mean that a man needs a woman. But I do think that God is saying so much more than, than just or only that. I believe this amazingly explains why humanity was created as two distinct persons. It's true for the male human, but also true for the female human. It is not good for you to be alone, for you to exist in solitude. 
Some of you, your existence is mostly this morning uh, in solitude. It's not good for you to be alone. God created two distinctly different persons. Did you ever see that, that movie? It's one of my favorites. That movie, Cast Away, with Tom Hanks. Some people think it was a terrible movie. I, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite movies. But do you remember... Do you remember in his aloneness, in his solitude, being cast away on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a deserted island, he created for himself this imaginary friend, Wilson. Do you remember that, the volleyball? It's, 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 maybe you think it was kind of silly, but it really speaks to the fact that isolation will drive you crazy. You don't thrive in, in, in an existence of isolation. We need each other. So again, God created two distinctly different persons. Humanity was created as two distinct genders, purposely designed, so that from the beginning we were designed to, to live in plurality, to live in community, to live in interpersonal unity. The fact that God created humanity as two distinct persons rather than just one is a significant move in God's reflecting the image of himself in humanity. God, the personhood of God, God, the Trinity, God, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1, 26. Hear the words of God in this. He says, Let us make humanity in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Now, we've looked at this entire, this entire uh, paragraph um, in weeks 1 and 2. God says, Let us make humanity to reflect our image. And then he created two distinct persons. So when you choose to go it alone, live a friendless, self-dependent life, you're, you're, not, you're not fully bury, bearing the image of God that has been instilled in you. We think, we think I'm, 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 you may even be thinking this right now, we think, like, oh, God could never need another. And, and as we define need, perhaps, perhaps that is a true statement. But God, God could never need another because that would make him weak. And then you probably go on and say, I don't need anyone else. I don't need a single friend because I'm not weak either. Listen to the words of Jesus. In John chapter 17, he's praying to his heavenly Father, whose will he has come to do. And he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory, now listen to this phrase, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Again, the Godhead, the Trinity, three distinct persons, one God, for eternity they lived, they coexisted, they have coexisted in, in unity, in, 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 in voluntary submission and in deep love. That is the Godhead. That is how God, the Trinity, has existed. And so we have been created in that image to reflect in God's creativity and in God's wisdom. God lives in community, the Trinity. And he has created you woman to, to live in community and 
reflect that image of God. We got uh, four big ideas today. Here's big idea number one. In light of this, in light of the fact that we are created to live this aspect of, of God's image out, number one, don't go it alone in marriage. Genesis 2.24 says this. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and holds fast to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There's so much to this idea of being unashamed in front of one another, to live in, in a marriage, in a relationship in which there is, which is devoid of shame. I've, I've preached on that in the past. I, I'll preach on it again in the future. But, but for today, let me just say this. Unity in your marriage is not just physical, but spiritual and emotional and, and profound mental unity of all dimensions are, are to be strived after or to be, or to be wanted or to be worked for. The, the Trinity is three persons in one, one God. And so if I were to say to you that in, that in marriage, as the passage says, two Two persons become one. So if, if, if marriage is an analogy of the Godhead, well, then it breaks down because we're only two and, and, the, and the Trinity is three, and, 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 that, and that's true. And, and we could also say that, well, that, that, that Paul says that actually marriage, the husband and wife, is, is, a, is an analogy or a reflection of, of the church being the bride of Christ, and that's true. But I also think there is something to be found here in this, 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 this analogy of the, the husband and the wife becoming one flesh and that reflecting or mirroring the relationship, the community in the Godhead. You say, yes, Pastor Randy, but, 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 but they're three in one, and we're just two in one, and that's true. And, and, and maybe this is a bit of conjecture on my part here, but if you think of the family unit, if you, if you have children. You think of the, there's like three distinct dimensions or persons trying to work it out in the house, trying to get along, trying to live in unity. And I do think in some way that is an analogy or in some way that does bear in your home, bear the image of God reflecting interpersonal unity. Reflecting voluntary submission among the members of the Trinity. When Jesus, who is no less God than the Father, says, I have, I have come to do the will of my Father. And that in no way makes him less than. And then the Father, and then the Father says of Jesus, One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. So those of you that are married, I would say this is a spiritual matter. You, you, you should fight for intimacy. You should fight for communication. You should, you should fight for closeness. Friendship in your marriage grows best in a well-tended garden. So, so do the work. Tend the garden care for your marriage. Practical ideas. I just, I just wrote these down late, late last night, but babysitters cost money, right? And sometimes it's a problem, and it's always worth it, but sometimes it's less than affordable. I would say that Lydia and I, um, in our 30s, when we were living in our 30s, relationship and, 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 and unity and closeness was, was the most challenging because we had kids, because we sometimes didn't have money for, for, for babysitters. But hey, turning off the TV, that's free, and, and that's worth it. And going on a walk, taking a deep breath and saying, I'm going to actually dare to risk, take the risk of 
sharing my thoughts, sharing my feelings, being honest. This will be worth it. And that's all free. Working on sexual intimacy and, 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 and all the problems with intimacy is, is worth it. And talking to a mentor, talking to an older couple who have been through what you're going through, um, going to a counselor, getting, getting some advice. You might say, really? Really? Are we talking about this in church? And, and I would say, yes, because it is a spiritual matter. God has designed you and your husband to, to become one flesh, to become one in every sense, and you will, you will thrive. You will live out the best reflection of the image of God in you, in your marriage, when you are best as a couple. Big idea number two. Don't hold to your children as your only community. Why? Because they move out. Some people here will tell you, they'll tell you, they'll, 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 they'll explain that to you if you haven't already figured that out. Your children will one day leave you, and that's the best thing that can happen. My children are in the process of leaving me right now. It feels like it's traumatic. It's traumatic. Um, I, I, what I'm about to say is, is a bit lighthearted, but I... I, I've always been intrigued. I've always been drawn to, uh, and I, I've always been drawn to when Jesus' mom speaks to him uh, regarding the need at the wedding. You know, he's a little bit older now than certainly not a teen. Jesus certainly isn't a teenager, but you still, you still, I, I, I still feel this sort of angst of a mom really wanting to hold on to her kid. And, and I, maybe I'm, hopefully I'm not reading into the, into the text, but, but do you remember the story where they're at the wedding and Jesus, or Jesus' mother says to Jesus, hey, Jesus, they need more wine. Like, maybe you ought to, you know, maybe you ought to show, show them your tricks. You know, they, they need more wine. And, and you remember what Jesus says? He says, what does that have to do with me? Now, I, I, maybe your parent, maybe you can imagine me like, you know, I was, you know, son, you know, daughter, the trash, it's full. And can't you imagine your kid saying, what does that have to do with me? Kids grow up. Kids, kids, and rightfully so, kids move out. Your children will be with you for a season. You need friends who will be there when your children move out. I mean, it sounds, it sounds so simple, but I just see it all the time in the church. People who live vicariously through their kids, and then their kids move out. They are devoid of any other relationships. Remember Hannah in the Bible? Hannah, she is the mother of Samuel. And she wanted for a child, and she prayed for a child. And, and she understood this. She understood what I'm saying, that, that, that your children, the best thing that can happen is that they will grow up, and they will move on, and they will ultimately serve the Lord. You remember the story of Hannah? She wanted for a child, and she prayed, and, and she sensed that the Lord was calling her to give her child over to ministry early in life. And so early in life, I mean, it speaks in terms of once little Samuel was weaned, she took him to the temple to serve. And, and clearly this was God's leading. Clearly God is not asking you to do this uh, step by step. But, but the spirit of Hannah's, Hannah's actions, her obedience to the Lord says much. She she believed that the Lord had for her, was, was calling her to give little Samuel over to service in the temple. Samuel 2 says this, verse 18. In the midst of all this, Samuel, a boy dressed in a priestly linen tunic. Let's read that phrase again. A boy dressed in a priestly linen 
tunic, served God. The boy Samuel was very much alive, growing up, blessed by God, and popular with the people. And this is really what you want ultimately for your child. This is a this is a good investment of your 15, 20 years. Well, in our culture, 20 to, to 40 years. Uh, pouring into your child to see that they ultimately walk out the door and they, they serve the Lord for the lifetime. But then when they do that, which will come sooner rather than later, where does that leave you if you are friendless? Big idea number three, the I invite you today to foster friendship with women in the church. You, woman, need friends. Even if you're married, you need, you need friends. If you are single, you need friends. A wonderful passage that some of you probably have memorized, Ecclesiastes 4, it says this, beautiful picture of a relationship between two, two ladies, two men, a, a husband and a wife. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. The litmus test, you've heard me in the last 10 years of preaching, you've heard me speak of this, uh, this litmus test, or maybe it's more of a, just a metaphor. But or, No, it's a, it's, a, it's a test for friendship. And that is, like, it's the, it's the uh, I'll drive out and find you sort of a friend. You've heard me talk about that before. Like, you, get, you, get, you, you break down, you know, two miles down um, uh, south on Boca Chica Beach, and it's 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, who are you going to call? Who's going to, you, who, you know, get out of bed and get in their truck and come get you? Like, when, when you fall down, who helps you get up? We all need friends. Woman, your reflection of the Trinity in relationship will take on various and unique forms over the course of your life. And one of the pleasures of life is having other women friends in the church. I'll show you a picture. This is just one example of a friendship in the church. This is a gospel community that Priscilla Russell uh, leads. And those are ladies that have each other's backs. If one of these ladies got stuck out in Boca Chica Beach, then the other would go come and get them. Maybe borrow my truck, but they'd come and get you. Um, and that's what we're talking about. The seasons of life that we go through, we need friends, and it reflects the unity and the diversity of the members of the Trinity. Listen to this, or read along with me this cool, this cool, this, this, this good quote. It's, it's somewhat long. It's Wayne Grudem. Wayne Grudem says this, marriage is not the only way in which the unity and diversity in the Trinity can be reflected in our lives. It is also reflected in the union of believers in the fellowship of the church. And in genuine church fellowship, single persons like Paul and Jesus, as well as those who are married, can have interpersonal relationships that reflect the nature of the Trinity. Therefore, building the church and increasing its unity and purity also promote the reflection of God's character in the world. It's Wayne Grudem. 
out of systematic theology. The, the point is that, again, life is long, and the many or the several ways relation, relationally in which you have the opportunity to reflect the unity, the diversity, the beauty of the Godhead, the Trinity, the way that you can do that, it comes in various forms, not just in marriage. If you are married, yes, you need women friends. If you are single, yes, you need women friends. You need interpersonal, interpersonal interaction. Paul, the apostle, was unmarried when he wrote 1 Corinthians 7, esteeming the, the life of singleness and celibacy. And, and we're going to be, it's going to be a rather hard-hitting sermon that, that I'm going to be preaching next week on that topic. In, the, in place of marriage for the Apostle Paul, in place of marriage, the Apostle Paul was in deep, platonic, non-sexual, spiritual relationships. And the result of his friendships and evangelism and, and discipleship, his life's work, the result of all of that as a single man, the result of all that was what he called his spiritual children. That was born out of his relationships as a single person. 1 Corinthians 4 reflects that. He says, I am writing as a father to you, my children. Think on how some of you fulfill this role in, in, in River Church. You parent spiritually other people. I, I'm writing as a father to you, my children. I love you and I, I want you to grow up well, not spoiled. There are a lot of people around you who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong, but there aren't many fathers. In our case, this is a sermon series on womanhood. Mothers willing to take the time and effort to help you grow up. There are women in this church mentoring other women in this church, and that is one of the great success stories of River Church. Big idea number four is actually a question that I want to like this, just briefly address. This is the one that I've gotten in trouble with uh, in the past. But what about having opposite gender best friends? What I mean by that is platonic relationships where you're a lady and your best friend is a man. You're a man and your best friend is a lady. And um, my thinking on this has, has actually evolved uh, a bit over the last f few years. I, I generally, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm generally quite nervous about this type of a platonic uh, male-female friendship, but I've, I've come to really believe that redeemed, when the gospel of Jesus Christ speaks into a friendship like that, redeemed, in a scenario where we're becoming more like Jesus, and that's the question, are you striving to become more like Jesus? In that sort of s scenario, this can work. Um, let's talk about Jesus. That's that's a safe place to land on this topic. Jesus, Jesus honored women distinctly and in very countercultural ways. Jesus had deep, personal, platonic, non-sexual relationships with, with sisters, with Mary and Martha. And with other, other female disciples in, in the larger crowd of, of disciples who traveled in his 
in his larger group of learners. And how he dealt with the woman at the well, with, with such, such dignity. The Samaritan woman at the well, John 4, a woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. And Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? See, his disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. And the Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, how, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. And all of that's absolutely um, relevant to this, this, this conversation between a man and a woman. woman. But what I want to really highlight here is she does say, I, I'm a woman. How is it that you speak to me? He, he saw dignity in her. He saw value and worth. He looked her in the eye. And he, he spoke in such a way that she was culturally startled. Men didn't look women in the eye and speak to them in public with such dignity in Jesus' day, but, but he did. Luke chapter 8, we looked at this one, uh, week 1, but I think it's worth reading again. After this, Jesus traveled about from town and village to, to I'm sorry, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. What does that mean? It, 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 it most probably means that these, these women um, had, had wealth, had means, and they were actually, with their money, with their resources, supporting the, the ministry of Jesus and the apostles as they were, as they were going about um, proclaiming the good news. Jesus saw dignity in women. Jesus looked women in the eye and treated them as friends to the degree that others accused him of sleeping with them. Why? Because, because in that day perhaps in our day as well. In that day, they had no category for a man who didn't sexualize and demean and talk down to women. But that was their problem. Jesus, in a very patriarchal, misogynist sort of culture, was radically countercultural in how he treated women. In a hyper-patriarchal historical context, men have been the most literate and the most powerful and the most privileged. But because of the good news of Jesus Christ, as He is redeeming us, uh, as God is redeeming His creation, um, you've heard me say it before, heaven is sometimes called the new creation. As God is redeeming His creation, and misogyny is being defeated and will one day be completely defeated. And the social and political advantages of, of being a male in our culture um, will, will, will in God's new creation be available to all. So, woman, uh, being just friends with, with the guy, given the fact that we're in this already but not yet sort of a, a, of a place where, where we're not, God's new creation has not yet been fully instated. Th therefore, being just friends with a guy, it's tricky, 
It can work sometimes. It's not forbidden in Scripture. But just know that because, of, because we live in the current culture that we live in, which in some ways hasn't changed all that much over the last 2,000 years, it, it is a difficult task, so navigate those waters carefully. All right, so now I end, I end each one of these, these uh, sermons. Or, uh, we, have, we have at least two, maybe three more weeks in this series. I always end it with a question, so we're going to do that again today. We're going to end it with a question. And here's the question today. All the questions over the last three weeks have been, been good and been like, oh, man, somebody's going to leave the church because of my answer. No matter what I say, somebody's going somebody's to get angry. I say this, or if I say that, so I'm just going to say what I believe God is leading me to say. What should I do? Oh, where is it? Let me put that question up. What should I do if a friend asks me to refer to them? Uh, see what I did there? To them using pronouns that are unfamiliar <laughs> to me <clears throat> or seem incorrect. What should I do if a friend asks me to refer to them? using pronouns that are unfamiliar to me or seem incorrect. Okay. Um, probably, if we're honest with one another, probably every one of, this, every one of us in this room, um, in our extended families, probably every one of us um, has uh, an aunt... Or, or a cousin dealing with, with, with brokenness. And you, you, may be, you may actually be that person in your extended family. And, 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 and I celebrate the fact that in that family context, in most cases, you do a good job of affording that person grace. There's a time for speaking truth into his life, into her life, this aunt, this uncle, this cousin. But, but most of us, we go to our extended family situation. Maybe it's Christmas Eve or maybe it's Easter and we're with people that we have. And we, we just, we just want to pour out grace on them. We just want to afford them all the grace that we can. And yet then sometimes in, in less significant relationships, we feel like we need to be some sort of uh, policing force uh, in, in a person's life that we've really, we really have n no investment in. So, so I don't know if, it, you know if you're asking this question, how deep is the relationship that you have with this person? If your friend is is dealing with uh, gender identity issues, um, number one, afford them grace. Number one, afford them grace. But then I would ask, what is, what is your role in this person's life? Are you a mentor? Um, are you discipling this person? Have you earned the right to be heard? If not, then there, there, is, there is a time and a place for simply calling a person what they asked, asked to be called. Not taking any sort of responsibility for life choices that they're making. I remember, and this is, this is, this is, uh, this is not exactly the same. It's not the same thing. But I remember I, I was in a band in my 30s, and there was this lady who... She had, a really, she had a really solid name, like Elizabeth, but she, but, she, but she always wanted to be called Scooter. And I just thought, like, I love Elizabeth. Why do I, I don't want to call you Scooter. And so everybody else called her Scooter. And for whatever reason, I decided I'm going to call her Elizabeth by her name. And I remember that was always like a needless sort of barrier between she and I. For whatever reason, I just didn't want to call her what she wanted to be called. And I still regret that. I, 
I wish I would have just called her Scooter. Now, that's not dealing with a gender issue. I understand that, that, that you may be, you may be, um, feel like there's, that, that, that in your relationship with this person, it is a good opportunity to teach this person about how God has designed them uniquely as a gender-specific person, and if that is your role and that is your relationship, then you do that. On the other hand, if you feel like it is a, it is a, it is a fairly shallow or budding relationship and you don't yet have the right or the authority uh, or the privilege of speaking into this person's life, you just barely know them, then I would, I would give you the freedom to call them what they ask to be called and don't feel like you bear any sort of guilt or burden or responsibility for that. And if you want a little more, if you want a little more uh, like freedom, like, oh man, I just, I hate this. I hate calling them they, but I feel like, you know, I, I'll give you some freedom and I'll just tell you that, that grammatically, historically, um, that, that pronoun, uh, all sorts of examples, many examples historically uh, in formal literature, how they uh, can be used in a singular context. So if you just want to rest in that, call them what they want to be called, and not feel guilty about it yourself. What would Jesus do in that context? I don't know. We'll ask Jesus one day when we, when we see him. I do know that when he, anytime he, he would speak to that, that hypothetical person that we're talking about, when they left the room, when they were done with the conversation, that person would always feel uplifted. That, that person would always leave a conversation that he or she had with Jesus feeling like he or she was a person of dignity, value, and worth. Oh, that our conversations with people might, might leave them with that same sense of dignity, value, and worth. Let's pray.